welcome to High Drama, where we're truly excited with the creative people we have before us for our guests. We've got Bob Alls from True and Kay Camarada from Create Theater. Now, True focuses on the producer, Kay focuses on the playwrights, but both of them focus on moving the creative people forward and successfully. Yay! <laughs> So tell us about your organizations, how you got it started, and how you keep it going through the pandemic, and how you've just been giving people hope. I've been doing this for 28 years. I am a playwright, composer, lyricist. I found it true um, because um, I wasn't getting produced, and I thought if I started hanging around with producers, I would get produced, blah, blah, blah. Um, it didn't work. It didn't work that way. So I, I basically, I, I met a couple of people who were producing, and everybody was having a hard time getting shows to happen. Uh, what you're talking about, how hard it is to make theater happen, it's, it's brutally difficult. Um, and uh, I asked people if they wanted to come and meet each other and help each other and talk about what they were doing and maybe learn from each other's experiences. And... Um, I invited three people and 30 people showed up. So I knew that I was onto something. I had a room full of people talking about how hard it was to make theater happen. And um, they were all surprised to find that other people were having the same problems they were having. So True was born. Um, and originally uh, we, were, we were actually set up as a producer's organization. We were a support uh, system for producers. Originally it was really just networking and, and uh, and support, just, just helping people feel like they weren't crazy doing what they were doing. Uh, and then we kind of evolved. And um, over the years, we've, we've brought in more than producers. We now help writers as well, which is why, why Kate and I work together. Kate came in as my literary manager uh, a couple years ago. Kate, how long ago did you, did you start with me as the literary manager? I started with you as a reader in uh, the 2011-2012 and by 2013, I had asked you if I could um, take over the literary office because I think you needed that. Oh, I said, oh, no, I want to do everything. Please yes. don't help me. Yeah, he needed <laughs> and, and I was just finishing up um, an MFA in dramaturgy, so I was raring to go. So it, it was perfect timing. Well, we actually met. We Many met, years before. Yeah, yeah, we had met uh, randomly. <laughs> and he remembers everyone. He does not forget a face or a name. And I have a different name, my married name, but he remembered me immediately. And I was really touched by that. We had a, she worked for somebody that was a dear friend of mine. Um, and it actually, it was the agent, Barry Moss. I like to say his name because I like people to remember him. And I worked for Julie Hughes. I was Julie Hughes' assistant. So right, we were right. there on the same floor. But he was on one end of the floor and I was on the other end of the floor. Yeah, that's Hughes Moss casting for those of you who don't know. I think, you know, I'm, um, um, a protege, I guess. I'm a graduate of BDMP from True. So I find that I've always wanted to give back to True, which is why I stay involved with True, because really the nicest people all center around True. And I, I figure it's like a home in this huge industry. And I think a lot has to do with Bob. I mean, Bob is just so generous and big hearted and knowledgeable that he, people tend to stick with him. Everybody knows Bob for one thing, you know? So I am really an outgrowth and it was very organic actually because I love the process. I mean, that's why I got an, um, a graduate degree in dramaturgy, just the creative process. So I'm a geek by nature, a little introspective, um, but yet engaging with writers and the process of any creator trying to put something on the stage really has always been what I'm about. So I bumped into dramaturgy and it was perfect, but I actually got a, a, a practical education in reading for, for True and also for the O'Neill and Nymph when it was around. Because the more scripts you read, the more you learn on a very practical level. So at the same time, I was the um, associate dramaturg down at here, down at the here Arts Center, which was really vastly different in aesthetics than uptown, uptown and downtown, but it really was very complimentary and I, I loved my time down at here. So I feel like I'm integrating what I've learned um, from True and PDMP and also the aesthetics of creating theater 
from um, here and other downtown organizations with putting together Create Theater. Kate, it would be, I think it would be, it's relevant to talk about your first ex uh, producing experience, which was, was uh, with us. Was with you. So um, I started reading and the, before I became literary manager, I came across a wonderful script, which was Adam Overit's um, My Life is a Musical. I was able to jump on board as the producer of, um, of that for the true reading series because it, it won. And through that, then it was instantly optioned. And I was not able to get the option because I was a real noob. So the agent gave it to a couple of other producers within um, Choose Orbit. And I jumped people, on. People, people, producers who actually came to see the, the reading and optioned it right out of the reading. Immediately, immediately. Doesn't so, always happen that way. So it was a wonderful learning experience, again, on a very practical level. And um, that happens with True more often than you would imagine. People read because True is um, set up so that three industry professionals read every script. Now, you may or may not want to ante up the 10 bucks for the, um, the feedback, but three professionals read your script. How easy is it to get a producer to read your script? Well, if you submit, then we guarantee three industry professionals. So sometimes um, people say, or the readers say, I love this script. I don't care if it wins or not. I want to direct this, or I want to produce this, or whatever. And I love making matches like that. Um, I'm off track now. So um, Create Theater what just was an outgrowth of all of that. And um, being a freelance dramaturg, I've been working with writers. In 2015, I founded Create Theater um, independently just to work more with writers on, on every coast over Zoom. So we started with Zoom on, uh, in 2015. So when the pandemic hit, I was already set up with a number of writers, all like in three continents. And I said, don't freak out. We're going to stay sane. I know that writers need a goal to stay sane. And I said, plus, you are going to give feedback to the other writers whom you don't know to help, you know, create like a little trusted feedback community. And that's how the Monday Night Reading Series was born, initially with people I was already working with. And uh, it just mushroomed so that in June of 2020, I formed Create Theater and the ETC because my philosophical mentor was Ellen Stewart. So I wanted the homage for the ETC, but now I, I call it the Experts Theater Company so that we can create and develop work. There is such synergy between uh, Create Theater and, and TRU. By the way, did we say that TRU or True stands for Theater Resources Unlimited? My board likes me to say the name of the organization. So <laughs> it's Theater Resources Unlimited. Um, Incredible synergy between between our, our two groups. I mean, we have a the crossover of the membership is pretty uh, wide. We have a lot of a lot of the same members. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention about about Kate and True is that she helped create a new program for us uh, six seven I don't know six years ago. She does come from a dramaturgical background, and I have a, a thirst and a hunger for good structure and and good dramaturgy with scripts. So uh, we talked about a way to do a musical workshop that would be different from other musical workshops. A lot of workshops actually just focus on songs, um, including the BMI workshop, which is basically, I mean, it's, it's the Cadillac of, of workshops. It's, it's, it's a great workshop. We decided that we wanted to have the songs presented in context of the scene, and we wanted to talk about the interaction between the scene and, and, the, and the song, the libretto and the music. Um, so we created how to write a musical that works um, with a lot of a lot of thought. I mean, I think it, Kate, it probably took us at least a year to to, to structure it and and and, and launch it. Um, and it's a three part workshop for the development of workshop of, of musicals. The other thing is, um, True is always looking for ways to help writers who aren't accepted into our reading series because. We only do three or four plays a year, and we do two or three musicals a year. So, and there's a lot of other good, worthwhile work out there, and we wanted to offer other opportunities. So, how to write a musical that works is an opportunity for people to come in at an earlier stage in their development of a show, and bring in a song in the scene, and get industry feedback from 
pretty smart commercial people, um, commercial producers, and our friend Ken from Disney, and you know, we, we got we have great people. And Skip, Skip Cannon, and and, and Nancy Galladay, who are both from the BMI workshop, uh, also uh, give feedback or on the panels for our workshop. So, um, Kate, what else do we we do a lot? We do a lot together. We do um, primarily those two. Um, we work really closely together in the play reading series and the musical reading series. Right now we're trying to figure out how to launch the musical reading series to be virtual. Um, that takes some thought so and some planning. Yeah, I, I, because of the lag and latency, if anybody out there has ever tried doing a musical with more than one voice singing a song, uh, it's, it, you can't do it live. You have, you have to pre-record and you have to post-production edit it. So it's complicated. Yeah, but True also has um, things in direct for directors, which I love. I don't run that. I just always want to participate because I'm also a director. <clears throat> and they have mediation. Um, they offer a lot to the industry itself. Um, so for my first year now, that I can't believe uh, ETC has been around for one year. So there's a difference, just so people don't know, between ETC and Create Theater. Create Theater is a larger community that is extremely supportive with each other, like the virtual happy hours um, and, uh, and ETC. ETC is what I've really been concentrating and building in the last year, which is those group of artists that want to knuckle down and roll up their sleeves and get to work. So again, putting in a lot of the things that I've learned through dramaturgy, through here, through true. <clears throat> Basically, I work with everyone. I try to work as individually as possible with actually making sure the script works and then working forward to actually produce it. And that was the Monday night reading series. And now we're looking, you know, since things are opening up to actually renting out space and producing um, the first go round of, of new work in, in for real on stage, you know, in person which uh, which is exciting, I think. So it's a new muscle you have to use though if, when you're going, because you, you're, you, you, because you didn't do more than anyone, so you know the, how it works. But then to bring it into live, it's just like that it's going to be an interesting transition. Well, it's not a transition. The company, I think development online is here to stay. Like Bob, I think that there's a critical need to incorporate talent from all over, not just New York centric, but from all over the globe. And it's a way and of getting out your work without it costing you a fortune. Absolutely. And networking and collaborating, right? So I think for development, it's here to stay. Monday night reading series, although I've, um, I've raised the criteria for the reading series, so I haven't been doing as much. I like to liken it to um, a workshop or tier one. Right. When you're ready for a tier one, let's put it on a Monday night. So the but we really do every Thursday we have a reading of a new work, which is the space, you know, like Ellen Stewart had a garage down on the Lower East Side. I don't have any real estate. I'm lucky to have my apartment. Right. But I have the space online where everybody can come. And I really ever since, you know, in my 20s, I've been wanting to have an artistic home for artists to come together and have a safe space to develop their own creative expression. So again, for my second year, I'm gonna concentrate on that. So it's not just producing on stage, although that has to be the end game, but it's development as well. I didn't have a chance to talk about our pivot to to uh, to virtual. And the, the reason I wanna mention it is because it, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier about offering hope. Um, for the when we were first put into shutdown, I was hopeless. I was I was depressed. I didn't know what to do. Uh, it it took me. I thought it took me a long time. Apparently, it only took me three weeks. But I I decided that I was going to do something constructive, and I asked people if they wanted to get together in Zoom. I had a Zoom account. I wasn't as Zoom savvy, as, re, remotely as Zoom savvy as Kate, but um, I had people hold my hand and sort of show me what a what a frame was and what a breakout room was and what this button was. And, and I, um, I polled my community and I asked how many people would like to come and meet on Fridays and talk about what they're going through. Cause they were, I mean, it was really hard for everybody. I don't think anybody was having an easy time of it. Um, 
I also think it's interesting that the universe sent us all to our rooms to think about things. Um, <laughs> but uh, here we are doing it. So I, I open up the room every Friday at 4.30. And since April 17th, I've done well over 60 or probably heading towards 70 uh, weekly uh, community gatherings. I have, I've have i only missed two weeks. One was Christmas and one was New Year's. Um, but other than that, it's been here for people to talk about what they do. And I'm still continuing to do it and because the virtual platform has brought in participants in a community from around the world. I can't stop doing it. I can't give it up. <laughs> I just can't give it up. Uh, lovely to have seen you both. And, and we, do, we do need to move on. Uh, and thank you so very much for joining us. It's fascinating and great what you're doing. Pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for asking us. And do you want to have any last words too, Kate? I just am very happy that I um, was able to appear on this, um, Eva. Thank you so much for asking me again and for putting me together with Bob because Bob has been, you know, really the catalyst for all of this, just for remembering me from years ago. And I'll always be grateful to him and for True and for the wonderful network that he's created with True. It really, I mean, everybody knows Bob, everybody knows True. And I'm just, you know, one of the very many, um, I guess, success stories that has gone through True. He's been an inspiration, so. And now it's time for Reviewer's Corner, starting with something Jan, Mark, and I all saw and loved called Judgment Day. Rob Ulin's Judgment Day humorously questions faith redemption Shyster lawyer almost dies. To avoid hell, he must do good deeds, but he's still awful inside. Can people change from their vile ways? It's a great cast and they really relish their roles with glee. They did a lovely, lovely job. Jason Alexander uh, played the lawyer and uh, he was really, really funny. And uh, you know, once something struck me about this is how good the acting was. My heaven, oh, yes. they were all just wonderful. Patty Lapone and Jason Alexander, Michael McKeon, uh, and that other young fellow who Santino played- Santino Quintana as Father Mike. Yes, Father Mike, Father Mike was great. And all, so were all of the others. The women were, were marvelous too. Uh, so I really, really uh, thought this was a, a, a good piece and certainly well worth a watch, yeah. Yeah, Patty Lapone, I mean, she was just, just cackling with glee. <laughs> <laughs> she was so funny and, you know, like she wrote up the idea that you're not judged by what's inside you, you're judged by your deeds. So that was one uh, viewpoint of what it means to be good and how to get into heaven. That's really why Jason really Alexander like felt he could just get away with just, you know, he was saying to Father Mike, he went there for a confession that's been so long, just to say, you know, sh send me your hardest cases. So he found this poor widow was about to lose uh, everything and but legally she didn't have a leg to stand on and the insurance agent played for michael mastro from sideman he was just would not budge and it's like can you machiavellian still do terrible things to accomplish good or do you have to fall back and be terrible just but to his, get good I mean, did, can you be good to do good or do you have to be bad to do good as he did good deeds he became good through the play i do believe that 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 Probably the message. But, but if it's inside, if you're not judged by inside, aren't your deeds reflection of your inside? Not well, necessarily. Eventually, not but according to the while. church. Not according to the church. In a moral sense, I, I agree with Dina. I think they are reflective. But the church specifically says it's the deeds that count, not the thinking. Well, but again, but if, if you do good deeds for a long enough time, even if at first you have very selfish motives, mm -hmm. he changed inwardly as well because of that. I would think so. And that's what happened to the, to the character. So, so. He's, got get... this, he's got this ex-wife. He's, he's trying to redeem himself with his ex-wife. He left uh, 10 years ago for nefarious reasons. There's this kid he's trying to help out who's like, you know, got a bad attitude. And he's like, and he tells him, look, as long as you do good, you don't have to be a good person. And that kind of makes the kid like, oh, wow. It just opens up eyes to do so, so you can be do good things. You can pay it forward and still be awful. And I love that. Yeah, right. exactly. and, and it was funny. It was very, very funny, funny too. Uh, I mean, not not just uh, not just a good lesson, but funny. 
Yeah. It's funny if you think seriously about it, you cannot be a good, if you do good deeds, you have to be a good person. Doesn't mean you are evil and you are going to be able to do all the good deeds. Not if you do it for selfish reasons. If you're doing it just to score points, you know, you're not thinking about being good inside. You, you are trained to be it's, terrible inside. You want to be terrible inside. You are proud of being terrible inside. You, I'm going to try that. But, <laughs> but it's like, okay, I can still be me. And still be good, but still keep my mean, nasty, awful side. Well, as, so a you think as a lawyer, his whole training was dirty tricks and stuff to help the um, corrupt people. Then he changes and still does dirty tricks and all sorts of things, corrupt things, but to help the good people. I gave this a major happy thing. Speaking of good people, you saw a movie about Mandela. No, it's not a movie. It was a live stage show. Oh, it was? And, yeah. And it's, um, it was very long. It was almost two and a quarter hours. But uh, if it were shorter, it would be really great because it gives great information about him. It does include some newsreel footage. So there are some multimedia elements. Um, it's his whole life, basically, from recruiting for the African National Congress to imprisonment for anti-apartheid activities to leading his country and even has him getting the key to the city of New York. Of New York. Mm. Um, again, I think it would be wonderful for teaching purposes if they made it shorter. It's as a drama, it's too bombastic and too didactic. But for students, I think it would be a great introduction to a great man's life. I gave it mixed faces. Mixed faces. Speaking of prisoners, I saw this um, uh, radio thing uh, called uh, Elizabeth Hawes Supernova. It recounts stories from prisoners in Minnesota State Women's Prison. There's many nationalities, needs, and feelings, but they are all moms who long for their kids. Yes. I found the stories compelling and the acting superb. And it's in, done in two parts. It's from Open Door Playhouse. I saw part one. I haven't seen part two yet, but um, you can find out the information on the website. And yeah, Mom, amazing, amazing how all those women have trouble with their kids. Even if they think they're giving it to people who might be helpful, sometimes the people turn out to be, their interests are different from the interests of the mother. Oh, you saw it too, Mark? I listened to it, yes. Oh, great. I didn't know you saw it. I liked it a lot as well. Yeah. Um, so that gets a happy face also. I saw an interesting piece last night, that uh, this week, that I uh, need, uh, need to write about still. And I'm sorry, she's running until August 1st. Is this uh, Lori Brown Mirabelle uh, at uh, Charmed Lives, uh, which is running at the Urban Stages until the 1st of August, alive. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting piece. She's a, a fascinating woman, had quite a career in music. She sang in the city opera. She sang, uh, she sang all over. And she's also, uh, from the very beginning, started singing gospel. And she started that way and watching and talk, her talking about her, her transition, because she was finally introduced to opera. And she said, well, I can really do that thing. And she said, I was the only black person in a room of white people and they were talking to me about singing <laughs> opera. And it's a fascinating story, a lot of fun. A, a, a lot of fun, and uh, and she's very happy about her life, and so I highly recommend it. I think I think I would give it a happy face minus, just simply because uh, there were a few vocal things I did not quite agree with, but that's uh, niggling. Uh, all in all, it's an excellent performance. Charmed life at the urban stages. And now it's time for that marvelous, fabulous, and interesting person, Jay Michaels with his indie influencer. Take it away, Jay. This is Jay Michaels. This is indie influencer. And this is high drama. Riddle me this. What do you get when you cross years of extensive theatrical training, keen observational skills, love of pop culture, and the amazing ability to think on your feet? You get the Improvisational Repertory Theater Ensemble. For almost a decade, the multi-award winning improv troupe led by founders Nanette Deasy and Robert Baumgartner have brought us uproarious improvised skits 
and what I would call naturally occurring short plays to audiences across the country. They and their elite funny force possess deep theatrical training and a love of pop culture. Imagine watching a group of versatile artists lampooning your favorite TV shows or Saturday morning cartoons unrehearsed with spontaneous audience participation and still making you laugh out loud a lot. After 18 months of holding on tightly as we went through the merry-go-round called COVID, they returned to their home base, the Producers Club, which is returning also with a season of improvised works that look quite familiar. The Marvelous Mrs. McCluskey premiering in October of this year is their send up of the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And in February of 2022, join them for Tammy's Bachelorette. Yep, you guessed it. But how do you lampoon the Bachelorettes, Housewives and Bridezillas when they're already lampoons themselves? Find out when you come and see them. Get ready to laugh and laugh and laugh and be impressed at their theatrical skill while laughing and laughing and laughing. They say laughter is the best medicine, so get ready for a huge dose this season for the Improvisational Repertory Theater's triumphant return to live theater. Improv, that's bravery. I even have to have my notes in front of me for this. This is Jay Michaels. This is Indie Influencer, and this is High Drama. Thanks, Jay. Our next show is August 14th, and coming up, we'll have guests from Red Shell Management Kitchen Choreographer's Blog, Dancers Put Together a Cookbook. I mean, how cool is that? So we're going to talk to them and lots of other people, and have a great July in August. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. And thanks for thanks for the show. Lovely time. Good guests. Today. And, 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 and,